Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. As you guys can see, I got my background all set up and hopefully the audio on this video is a lot better than the last one. As I was editing it, I realized that the audio was pretty echoey and pretty bad, so I really hope that it's better now. But either way, I don't wanna spend too much time on that because this case today is a very long one with a lot of information. The case that I have for you guys today is definitely on my list of the top five most bizarre disappearances that I've ever looked into. To. I literally cannot fathom how this entire thing happened. I'm so confused and frustrated with this entire thing, and I know you guys will be too. But before we get into today's case, I just wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creatives like me. It allows you to explore new skills, deepen your existing passions, and just get lost in a little world of creativity. They have thousands of classes for creative and curious people on topics like illustration, design, video, Video, photography, and even starting your own YouTube channel. Most of Skillshare's classes are under an hour with short lessons that can fit anybody's schedule. One of the classes I'm taking right now is Productivity for Creatives, Build a System that Brings Out Your Best, taught by Thomas Frank. This class is all about how you can boost your productivity without feeling like you're speeding through projects or just trying to crank out your work. You guys know that I juggled this YouTube channel as well as my doctorate program, and I'm not gonna lie, that can be very overwhelming at times. But this class has really taught me how to set myself up for success while still chugging along in medical school while also being successful on YouTube, which is my ultimate goal. And a lot of you are always asking me how I do what I do, so I think this class can be really helpful for you, especially if you're somebody who wants to add a little bit of a side hustle in your life or just be more productive in your life overall. It's really cool because Skillshare believes that a community is essential to personal growth. So you can get support from fellow creatives just like you who provide encouragement, communication, and inspiration, which sometimes is exactly what you need when you're trying to learn new skills or improve on your existing ones. Knowing that there are others learning alongside you and helping you through all of it can be so encouraging. I am ecstatic that Skillshare is continuing to work with me on YouTube videos and they have yet another very special offer for you guys. The first 1,000 of my subscribers that click the link in the description box below will get a free one month premium trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity. Try something today that you couldn't do yesterday and start growing your skills as a creative. Thank you again so much to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's video. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Tyler Davis. Tyler James Davis was born June 30th, 1989 to his parents, Rhonda and Kevin Davis. Tyler was described as being a hardworking, dedicated young family man. He was funny, kind, and a great provider to his family. Tyler met his wife, Brittany, in 2013. The two had known each other through work and had been friends for quite a while before they started dating in 2016. The two dated for about a year before Brittany gave birth to their son, Aaron, near the end of 2017, then got married in November of that year. Now, Tyler worked as a manager at Wendy's in Wilmington, Ohio, where he would work 50-hour work weeks, he would work the night shifts, so he was pretty much always working his tail off. Brittany worked as a bartender part-time when she could to help make ends meet. Basically, the two were night owls and both of their jobs reflected that. Now, the couple was self-proclaimed homebodies and they didn't have a lot of money, so they really didn't go out much. The two pretty much only went out on special occasions such as Tyler's birthday or Brittany's birthday or their anniversary. So really, they only went out about three times per year. The weekend of February 23rd, 2019 was Brittany's 23rd birthday weekend, so her and Tyler decided that they wanted to go out to celebrate. Tyler had the weekend off after working six 11 or 12 hour shifts in a row. And again, he usually worked nights, so he didn't get home until around three or 3.30 that Friday night. And their son was almost two years old at this point, which is such a great age, but toddlers are exhausting. So they were pretty exhausted from the week that they just had. So they were really excited to get out, relax, and just spend some time together as a couple. They decided that they were going to spend their week 
Beacon out in the Eastern Ohio area, which was about an hour and a half drive from their home. So they booked a room at the Hilton in Easton Town Center, and they were going to leave Aaron with Tyler's parents for the weekend while they went out. So the day that they planned to leave for their weekend out, they had planned to get lunch with Tyler's parents before dropping off Aaron with them. They were actually supposed to meet them at noon on the 23rd, but they were up really late the night before, again, because of their work schedules. So they didn't even end up waking up for the day until 12.30 p.m. So they got up, got all of their last minute belongings all packed up, and they were on their way to meet Tyler's parents for lunch. They got there at around 2 p.m., ate their lunch, and they were done at around 3 or 4 p.m. After lunch, they handed off Aaron to Tyler's parents, and they were on their way to Easton. Once they got to Easton, they just went to their hotel and just hung out there for a couple of hours. Again, they were really tired from being up so late the night before, so they just wanted to relax and chill for a couple of hours. Now, as they were getting ready to leave, they got into contact with one of Tyler's close friends to meet up with him so that they could all go out together. Now, I did find out this friend's name on some different websites and articles as I was doing my research, but those involved and police investigating don't want his name released because he's been getting a lot of harassment and a lot of things online, which we will get more into later in the video. But because of all that, I am not going to be saying his name. I'm just going to be referring to him as the friend throughout the rest of the video. Now, this friend lived pretty close to them in the area, so he got to the hotel at around 8 p.m., so they all headed out for the night at around 8.30 p.m. Now, the Easton Town Center is huge. There's tons of stores, a ton of things to do, and it's a really nice little area, and it's basically like a little small town. Their plans for the night were basically to just have fun, walk around, get some drinks, and that's about it. Nothing too crazy. So when they left, they started their night just by walking around, going to all of the different shops, and just sort of shopping around for a while. They did that for about 45 minutes before they left and went to a bar called Bar Louie at around 9.20. At this bar, Brittany said that she had about two drinks while Tyler had only about a drink and a half. They stayed there for about 40 minutes before leaving at 10 p.m. Then there was another bar called Adobe Gila's right next door that they went to to have a couple more drinks. At this bar, they each had around three or four drinks. Now, most of the drinks that Tyler had were shots or whiskey on the rocks. He wasn't a huge fan of mixed drinks or beers or anything like that, while I believe Brittany was drinking cocktails the whole night. They ended up staying at the Adobe bar until around 11.30 p.m. After going to those bars, Brittany says that she was a little bit tipsy. She was feeling the drinks, so they decided to go back to the hotel so that they could get an Uber and keep drinking without having to worry about driving that night. After they got back to the hotel, Brittany said that it was her idea to head over to the Dollhouse, which is a strip club and bar. Brittany said that she had never been to a strip club or anything else like that, and she just kind of wanted to see what it was like and do something that she'd never done before. So after they got back to the hotel, they went up to the bathroom and started getting ready while just waiting for their Uber to arrive. The Uber showed up and it was about a 20 minute ride before they got there at 1245 a.m am now February 24th. Once they got there, of course, they got a couple of drinks at the bar. Brittany got a mixed cocktail. Their friend was drinking a Captain and Coke, and Tyler was just taking shots as he normally did. Now, I will note that when I say that Tyler was taking shots all night instead of getting normal drinks, that doesn't mean that he was just letting him down one after the other. He would basically have just as many drinks as anybody else, so only like two or three at a time, but he was drinking them slowly, so he would take his shot or maybe take take sips of the shot and then, you know, kind of chill and then get it later. So I wanted to just note that, that he's not just throwing back shot after shot. So at the dollhouse, Brittany remembers that each of them got about three or four more drinks. And then Brittany and Tyler just sort of hung out together, sat around while the friend went off and did his own thing. So their time at the dollhouse wasn't too crazy, but Brittany did go on to describe some kind of strange things that happened while they were there. Now, of course, at the time, she didn't think that they were very strange but looking back, she does see how these things could be a little bit weird. So as the two were hanging out there for a little bit, Brittany and Tyler wanted to go outside to smoke a cigarette. Brittany tried bringing her drink outside with her, but the security guard just told her no. They were not allowed to bring their drinks with them outside of the bar. Now, 
Brittany knew that especially as a woman, you should never leave your drink unattended, especially at a bar where you've never been, you're not from the area, and you don't know anybody there. But they wouldn't let her bring her drink outside, so against her sort of intuition, she did decide to leave her drink inside unattended for a few minutes while she went outside to smoke a cigarette. So after smoking, they got back inside and she grabbed her drink, which was still pretty full at this point. She took a few sips of her drink and then gave it to Tyler and went into the bathroom. Room. Tyler waited outside for her, but as he was doing so, he did pretty much finish the rest of her drink. After she was finished, she walked out and noticed that all of the lights had been turned on in the club, so that probably meant that they were closing down and they needed to leave. But as she was walking out of the bathroom around the corner, she heard Tyler arguing with the bouncer. The bouncer was kind of yelling at Tyler, telling him that he needed to leave, but Tyler kept telling him, no, I'm waiting for my wife. She's in the bathroom. She'll be out in just a few minutes. But the bouncer bouncer didn't seem to believe him and kept insisting that he leave. But just as that was said, Brittany came out of the bathroom, turned around the corner, and Tyler pointed her out and said, there's my wife, now we can leave. So after she came out, the two left. At that point, both Brittany and Tyler's phones were about to die, so they asked the friend to call their Uber back to the hotel. They waited for about 25 minutes for the Uber to get there, and then they were picked up at 3.01 a.m. The friend sat in the front passenger seat, and then Tyler sat behind the driver in the back seat, and then Brittany also sat in the back seat behind the friend. As they were driving the 17 minutes back to the hotel, Brittany noticed that Tyler fell asleep in the car before they arrived back at 3.18 a.m. So Brittany woke up the friend so that he could help her wake up Tyler. Tyler was a pretty heavy sleeper and Brittany described that she didn't like waking him up when he was in a deep sleep. He was hard enough to wake up as it was, but of course he was drinking, so she wanted some help from the friend to get him to wake up. So once they arrived at the hotel, Brittany and the friend got out of the car and opened Tyler's door to wake him up and get him moving. They woke him up and Tyler was immediately confused and was a bit out of it. Tyler told them to give him a minute to wake up, but they were still in the Uber. The Uber driver was just sitting there waiting and he was starting to get annoyed and he didn't have a ton of time to just sit there and wait for Tyler to decide that he was ready to get up. So they both got him out of the Uber and grabbed him by the arms and were like, come on, let's go back to the hotel and let's get some sleep. However, once he woke up a bit more, he suddenly became very agitated. He basically started saying, where are we? We're not where we're supposed to be. We shouldn't be here. Brittany tried explaining to him that they're exactly where they're supposed to be. They're at their hotel and they just need to go inside. Tyler wanted none of it. He was exhausted from working 60 weeks the week before. He had a couple of drinks in him and it was 3.30 in the morning. It was not a good mix. So Tyler suddenly got very frustrated and just started walking off. Brittany started following Tyler, but the friend basically said not to. He said that he'll stay with Tyler, don't worry about it, he'll keep him safe. Earlier in the night, Tyler gave this friend a room key because he assumed, you know, if you're drinking, you might be spending the night in our hotel room. And of course, Tyler and Brittany assumed that they were just going to be together the whole night, so they shared the one room key. So because the friend had the other room key, he said, don't worry about it, go up to your room, we'll be right behind you. So she did. She went upstairs and she immediately plugged in her phone. It was dead at that point and she just wanted to get it charged enough so that she could go back out and start calling Tyler. Then once it got turned back on, she went back down to the hotel lobby to see if they had shown back up. But she didn't see them, so she just started calling them, messaging Tyler on Facebook and trying to video chat with him through Facebook. She didn't really get her phone to much of a charge. She literally got it to 4% and then unplugged it and went downstairs, so she really didn't have the battery to be standing there and waiting for very long. But then, by 3.37 a.m., Tyler called Brittany to tell her that he's sorry, he's just walking around and smoking a cigarette. She was annoyed, of course, but she said, whatever, I'll just be waiting for you, come back soon. But then, a few minutes later, the friend walked into the hotel lobby, but Tyler was not with him. Brittany asked the friend where Tyler was, and he said, don't worry about it, Tyler's fine, he's just walking off and blowing off some steam. He assured Brittany that this is a very safe area. 
which it was. It was basically just this big outdoor shopping mall with a bunch of shops around. There was nothing to worry about. The friend assured Brittany that Tyler was going to be perfectly fine. But that didn't stop Brittany from being very confused and frustrated. Sure, it was a safe area, but Tyler didn't know the area at all. He wasn't familiar with his surroundings and he was clearly already confused and agitated when he got out of the Uber. So who knows what mental state he's in at this point. She was kind of panicking at this point because she didn't didn't know how Tyler was going to make his way back. She was a bit annoyed too because it was getting so late and they had things planned for the next day. They had booked a couple's massage and they were going to do some more shopping and then they had to leave the hotel and check out by noon and then go pick up Aaron. So they needed to go to bed as soon as they possibly could. Brittany was just walking around outside wherever she could to see if she could spot Tyler but she couldn't find him and she had absolutely no idea of where he went. So then 20 to 30 minutes passed before Tyler called Brittany again at 4 10 a.m. He said on the phone that he's sorry, that he sees the hotel, he's walking through the woods, and he'll be there in five minutes. So Brittany and the friend just stood outside in front of the hotel waiting to see Tyler walk up. But then about one minute after Tyler hung up this phone call, he called back. Brittany answered, and this time the line was silent. It was just silence for four seconds before the call ended. She tried to call him back immediately, but it just went straight to voicemail. Brittany didn't think too much of this because his phone was already dying by the time they left the dollhouse, and it had been about an hour since they had left, so she knew that his phone probably just died. But Brittany was getting really, really worried. She waited and waited, but Tyler just didn't walk up. So she started saying to this friend, come on, let's go get in the car, let's drive around, let's look for him, we have to do something. But the friend reassured her again. He said, don't worry about it, he's fine, this is a safe area, he'll show up in just a second. But then after waiting for just a little bit longer, the friend wanted to leave. According to Brittany, she was really upset and she didn't want this friend to leave, but he really wanted to go home and he was so sure that Tyler was just going to be fine and that he was just going to walk up in just a minute. So at 4.30 a.m., this friend did go home. So after the friend left, Brittany went back up to their room and started calling anybody that she could. She didn't know what to do at all, so she just wanted to get a hold of some friends and ask them for advice. She ended up getting a hold of one of her good friends and told her everything that was going on, and she too reassured her. She said, it's only been a few minutes since you last talked to him. He's probably fine. She continued talking on the phone with this friend for about 25 minutes while the phone was charging before she went back outside to walk around and look for him more while still talking with this friend on the phone. She was, of course, really frustrated because at this point, it was almost 5 a.m. There wasn't a single other person walking around. It was a complete ghost town. There was nobody else around, but she still couldn't find Tyler anywhere. She started walking about a mile in one direction before she started getting to an area that just wasn't very well lit. And her phone started dying again, so she went back to the hotel and started to charge her phone again. She plugged her phone in and then hung up with her friend and then started calling anybody else that she could get a hold of. She was calling every single one of Tyler's friends to see if they had heard from him. She explained the situation to each person, but nobody had seen him or heard from him. She also tried calling a bunch of local jails and hospitals to see if he had maybe been injured or arrested for public intoxication, but there was no luck with that either. So by 8 a.m. that morning on February 24th, Brittany did get a hold of one of their mutual friends. Her, Tyler, and this friend had actually been roommates before they had Aaron, so this friend was pretty close with both of them. He did live pretty close nearby, so he offered to come to the hotel and help Brittany search for Tyler. He got there and they drove around for about 45 minutes looking for Tyler. Of course, at this point, Brittany was just hoping to find him passed out somewhere and their old roommate was expecting the same thing. After they drove around and checked wherever they could, they went back to the hotel to see if he had ever gone back. They kept going back and checking the room because this entire time, Brittany was thinking, okay, we're gonna go back to the room and he's gonna be there and he's gonna laugh at me for being so worried and for even getting our old friend involved and this will all just be a big joke soon. But they didn't find him. He wasn't at the hotel. This started just feeling more and more serious. So by 10.30 a.m., Brittany finally decided that it was time to call Tyler's parents. 
This was something that she really didn't want to do because Tyler was very close with his parents and she didn't want them knowing that she lost Tyler on her watch. But she did. She called them and tried explaining everything that she could, including the fact that she called local hospitals and jails and got no luck with that. So Tyler's dad, Kevin, decided to come out and meet up with her to figure out what they should do. She waited for about 45 minutes before Kevin arrived and the two just started driving around together and searching for him once again. After driving around for quite a while, Kevin asked for more specific areas that she knew about that he could go look for Tyler and she told him. So at that point, Kevin got out of the car and started searching on foot for Tyler. As that was happening, Rhonda, Tyler's mom, called Brittany back and told her that she needed to file a police report. So Brittany called police at around 11.30 a.m. to report Tyler missing. Then police met her at 12.30 p.m. to take down all of her information. And of course, right on beat, they told her that Tyler was an adult. He could go missing if he wanted to. He wasn't a child. He's not elderly, so there's nothing to worry about. They told her that because he's an adult, they couldn't do anything to help her for 72 hours. But she knew that something was wrong. She knew that he wouldn't just leave his life like that. Brittany said that if he didn't want to be with her anymore, he would have just told her. She also said that he loved his son very, very much and would never want to leave him. But she went on to say that even if something weird did happen where he did decide that he wanted to leave his wife and his son, Brittany says that there's absolutely no way that he would leave his mother without any answers. He was such a mama's boy and they had the closest relationship. She knew that if nothing else, he definitely would never have left his mother. But after looking around all day by 5 p.m., Kevin told Brittany to just go get Aaron and that he would keep looking. So she went back and grabbed Aaron, but since they still hadn't found Tyler and she was just so worried and she wanted to to make sure that she was there and helping with all of the search efforts. She asked Rhonda if it was okay if she put Aaron back to bed and go back to help with the searches. By the time she got back, it was Sunday evening and she had not gotten any sleep, but she was so worried about Tyler and she was determined to find him. So she and a few of Tyler's close friends went back to Easton to search around the area for Tyler again. They started at 1 a.m. on Monday the 25th and they didn't stop until 7 a.m. They went into every single little patch of woods by the Hilton to see if they could see the hotel from there. They looked in any area of woods that, you know, if you were walking through them, that you'd be able to see a hotel from there. So they were going off of the assumption that if he was intoxicated, he was exhausted, it's absolutely possible he was walking towards the wrong hotel. So they found every patch of woods that they could that was around the area, and they walked through those and just went any direction to where they could see any hotel. So literally any area of woods that you could see a building that looked like a hotel from there, they searched it. But still, they had no luck. Brittany also went back to the hotel to ask the manager if they could look at any security footage to see if they had picked up Tyler at any point in the night. And pretty quickly, hotel security got back to her and said that they did see him walking back towards the hotel at 4.15 a.m. the night that he went missing. This was a little bit of a relief to her and it made perfect sense because that's when he called her and told her that he was walking back towards the hotel. However, after she checked the footage, she realized that the person on the video was was not Tyler, it was the friend who had a similar build to him. This video was picked up around the time that Brittany and the friend had split up momentarily to walk their separate ways and look for Tyler. To their surprise, they didn't find any surveillance video that picked up Tyler at all, which was really weird because that area had a ton of surveillance. It almost seemed impossible that he wasn't seen at all. So police didn't start their official searches until Tuesday, February 26th. They were using Tyler's cell phone pings to try and figure out areas that they should search. They concentrated their searches on nearby bodies of water near the hotel and even brought out cadaver dogs to assist in the searches. Then police called Brittany and told her that dogs had actually hit on an area near the pond. So going off of this, they searched that pond numerous more times using all sorts of different equipment and different dogs, but once again, they found absolutely nothing. There was no trace of him anywhere, not a shoe, his phone, a wallet, a sock, 
anything. So at first, police were pretty tight-lipped about the entire investigation. They didn't release much about his cell phone records or his social media or anything else in the months following his disappearance. However, after some time had passed with absolutely no leads and no luck, they did release a couple of things. So first, police found and verified all of the phone calls from Tyler's phone to Brittany that she had originally told them about. They also found GPS information that showed that he did walk away from the Hilton by himself. Himself. They saw that he walked through the Huntington Bank Complex on Stelzer Road before putting directions in his phone back towards the hotel. And when you look at the map, this street is right next to a small wooded area. But then they saw that Tyler was by the Abbott Labs Complex. This is pretty far from the hotel for someone to walk. It's about a mile and a half away and is about a 30 minute walk from the hotel. So police started searching any wooded areas or wetlands that they could around where they knew that his phone had last pinged. There's an area by Stelzer Road and Morse Crossing where there's a swamp that police have said that they searched multiple times. You can also see as I just scroll around this map that there's a decent amount of small wooded areas, patches of land, and some of those patches are wetlands and swamps. Police have said that they've searched all of these areas but haven't found a single thing. They also released audio from Tyler's phone where we can hear Tyler asking his phone for directions back to the hotel. Now, it took me a couple of times listening to really understand what he was saying at all. I even slowed it down to see if I could understand what he was saying, but to me, it's really, really hard to understand. I think it says, take me to Easton Suites. So I'm going to play it for you a couple of times. It's only a two second clip, so it's gonna sound like he's just repeating himself, but I'm just playing it over and over again so that you can maybe hear and better understand what he's trying to say. Take me to Eastern Suites. Take me to Eastern Suites. Take me to Eastern Suites. So after this, there really isn't much more information about Tyler's case. Police have said that they've continued to search everywhere that they can, but they haven't found anything. So before we get into the theories, there's a couple of things that I wanted to touch on in this case that I wanted to point out. So I'm gonna kind of go in chronological order of things that stood out to me throughout the case. So Brittany told this story about how she left the bar to go out and smoke and then left her drink alone and then it came back in and really only took a couple of sips of it before she went to the bathroom and Tyler basically finished her drink for her. So first of all, I was actually listening to True Crime Garage about this case, which I will have linked down below and the host is actually from this area and he said that it's very common in this area for bars to be very strict about people bringing their drinks outside with them. So the fact that she wasn't allowed to bring it outside, that's completely normal. However, it's thought that it's possible that after she left her drink unattended, someone slipped something into her drink and intended to drug Brittany. But as we know, instead of Brittany drinking it, Tyler ended up drinking it. So that could explain why he fell asleep sleep so quickly in the Uber, why he was so groggy and confused, and why he was so irritated. But of course, the other thought along these lines is that we know that Tyler had just worked 60 hours the week before. He barely slept the night before, and they were up until 4 a.m. He was probably absolutely exhausted, so even if his drink wasn't spiked, he could have just been delirious and agitated because he was so exhausted. So, given these two things, it's possible that after he walked off, he was just completely out of it. When you're sleep deprived to a certain point, you stop being tired and you just get this random delirious energy. I actually suffer pretty badly from insomnia and I've gone three or four days at a time with getting less than four hours of sleep at night, so I can attest to this. At a certain point, your brain just starts doing really weird things. You can't function on that little of sleep no matter how good people say they are at functioning on no sleep. You start forgetting things. You get turned around easily. It's so easy to get confused and irritated and anxious. So I think that Tyler may have been walking in the wrong direction, but the entire time that he was walking, he thought that he was heading towards the hotel. We know that he went by this condo complex and the Abbott Labs. Those are also big buildings that are by wooded areas. So maybe when he was in those areas, he was convinced that he was looking at the hotel and told Brittany that he was walking towards the hotel when really he was walking in the completely wrong direction. So that's basically what I wanted to discuss relating to Tyler's GPS about where it said he was going and what he was doing. So now knowing what we know and keeping all of this in mind,
mind, let's go over the possible theories. The first theory surrounds the friend that Tyler and Brittany were with. Again, most websites have not released his name, and I did, again, personally find his name on one of the websites that I went to, but apparently he's been harassed online, he's been threatened, and all of that. So as I get more into this theory, I just want everybody to keep in mind that he is innocent until proven guilty, and again, I won't be saying his name out of respect for the investigation. I think it's really unfair that somebody is being harassed and threatened online just based off of theories. So if you do happen to find out his name in your own research, please just don't give him any harassment. He is innocent until proven guilty. But there are a few questions that I have about this friend. First of all, what happened when he and Tyler were alone after he told Brittany that she could go up to her room and that he could handle it? Did they get into some sort of heated argument? Why did this friend decide to leave Tyler alone in this unfamiliar area, coming back to Brittany and saying that he just needed to blow off steam. That part really confused me because if he was just irritated and confused, I don't see why he would need to walk off and blow off steam. Why didn't this friend just get Tyler to come back? And also, why did this friend keep insisting that Brittany not go with them? Why did this friend tell Brittany to go back to their room in the first place? After she kept saying that she was worried, why did he kept saying, don't worry about it, he's fine, don't go out and look for him? That's another thing that really just confuses me because when you think about him just walking off and leaving Tyler by himself, I can definitely see that being explained that maybe Tyler was just being hard-headed and he was being stubborn and wouldn't come back to the hotel. So the friend just left him and said, he'll come back eventually. He'll be fine. Just, you know, wait for him and he'll be back. So that can definitely explain why he let Tyler just walk off, but it doesn't explain why he kept insisting that Brittany don't go out and look for him. If the friend did something that he didn't want Brittany to know about, that could explain why he was like, no, don't go looking for him. He'll be fine. He'll be back in just a few minutes. Unless he didn't want Brittany to also get lost, which also kind of doesn't make sense because Brittany at least seemed to be in a pretty decent mental state at that point. So if she went off looking for Tyler, she probably wouldn't have gotten lost. Then we also have to ask, why did this friend go home? I could see if Brittany was just chill about everything, saying, yeah, I'm sure he'll be back. You know, just go home and I'll let you know when I see him. But no, she was panicking. She was freaking out. Why would he just leave knowing that she was so worried instead of just waiting for Tyler to get back or helping her go out and look for him? If he really thought that Tyler was going to just be back in a couple of minutes, it shouldn't be that long of a wait for him to just wait until he gets back. It's only going to be a couple more minutes. It's not that much of a difference. Now, I can see how all of this can look very suspicious, but then on the other hand, I can also see how it can be seen as not so suspicious. If the friend really was totally convinced that everything was fine, that Brittany was just overreacting and was exhausted because it was 4.30 a.m. at that time, I could see him just wanting to go home. This friend probably knew Tyler pretty well and maybe he's seen this type of thing before. They were college friends, so maybe he's seen this exact same thing where Tyler passes out somewhere and just wakes up and gets home the next morning. I can see that if Tyler did have any of these other past behaviors and this friend knew him pretty well, that he would be totally chill in this situation, think, you know, of course it's his wife, of course she's gonna overreact, she's worried about him. All women do is worry about their husband so of course she's overreacting. He could totally just be thinking, you know, this is my buddy. He's done this before. He's fine. You're just overreacting. So I don't think him leaving in and of itself is the most suspicious thing. But after that first night, I haven't heard anything else about this friend. The next day, when Brittany was still desperately searching for Tyler, as far as I know, this friend did not come back to help. And I haven't heard anything else about him helping in any of the other searches. Brittany literally stayed up for two to three days straight without getting a single hour of sleep just searching for Tyler. Yet, this friend couldn't be bothered to come back and help search the next day? I get that it's not your husband or your spouse, but it was one of his best friends. You would think that he would want to do whatever he could to help. But just to play devil's advocate here, we really don't know this friend's life. Maybe he had work the next day and that could explain why he wanted to leave early and why he didn't come the next day. Maybe he had other responsibilities that he just couldn't leave behind and he already knew that Brittany was doing everything that she could to help find him, so he figured that he wasn't really needed. I don't know, I think that could also be his mindset, but I do 
do also want to mention that he did refuse to take a polygraph test and he hired a lawyer. But does this mean that he's guilty? No. He was intoxicated that night. Maybe him and Tyler did get into an argument that caused Tyler to walk off and something happened which resulted in Tyler getting hurt. Even if this friend didn't hurt Tyler himself, he could feel responsible in a way for causing a fight that caused Tyler to want to walk off and then get injured. So I could see knowing this why the friend wouldn't necessarily want to take a polygraph. And him being intoxicated could skew his memory, therefore skew the results. Him feeling guilty and maybe feeling more responsible than he actually is could also make him look guilty. Polygraphs are definitely not the most reliable, but if you fail one and you really are innocent, that would make him look really bad. So bad that it could hurt the investigation, especially if he had nothing to do with it. Then him hiring a lawyer, as I say in so many other videos, isn't necessarily suspicious either. He was there when Tyler was last seen. He was with him. There is no denying that. No matter what, if you are in any way connected to someone who goes missing or is killed or anything like that, you should hire a lawyer whether you're guilty or not. Am I saying that this friend definitely didn't do anything? No, but I also want to say that I can't think of any reason why he would. What would be this friend's reason to hurt Tyler? And how? Did he tell Brittany that he was leaving and then go find Tyler's body and then bury it somewhere in a different location where he knew they wouldn't look? Maybe. But I just don't see a motive. There are a lot of weird things about what happened that night, but I think pretty much all of them are relatively explainable, and that doesn't mean that he killed his friend. Again, there are some weird things, and this is always a possible theory, but I just don't know any reason why this friend would just randomly want to hurt Tyler. So the next theory is that Brittany is involved. Now, after hearing this case, reading all of the articles that I could, and hearing the story directly from Brittany, I don't think that she is in any way responsible. I want to say that up front because after this case came out, so many people spent so much time just dissecting every little thing that she said to make her seem more guilty. She's done whatever interviews that she can to try to spread awareness about Tyler's case and people will say that she sounds nervous or that it sounds rehearsed. First of all, if you step foot in front of a camera or a microphone for the first time and you've never been on, you know, a video or a podcast, podcast, you're gonna be nervous. Then, when she tells the story, she wants to make sure that she tells every single detail that she can as accurately as she can, so of course, she's gonna read it off of a prepared document to make sure that she doesn't miss anything. Then, Brittany will talk positively about Tyler, saying, you know, he's a great father and he was a great provider for this family, and people will dissect that and say, oh, she was only with him for the money. She probably just wanted his life insurance policy. That is just so ridiculous to me that she's not even allowed to call him a great father and a great provider without being scrutinized. Then she started a Facebook page called Bring Tyler Davis Home to spread more awareness about his case. But the more members that joined, the more people that would go in there and make wild accusations against Brittany, so much so that she had to go in and delete members off of the page and delete posts off of the page. Then one of the members that got kicked out actually started another Facebook group called Crime Junkies Tyler Davis Missing Case Discussions, where again, they just speculated about Brittany and this friends and saying how they're responsible for all of this. Then there's been a bunch of different spinoff groups of a bunch of different people all saying the same things. People are on there literally just trash talking Britney and saying such horrific things about her. I want to come right out and say that I don't personally think that there's anything pointing towards Britney in this case. Pretty much everything that she's said to police or in interviews has come out to be true. She's told the same exact story every single time and has not waited wavered. The timeline is proven to be correct. The phone calls are correct. Everything that she says is correct. When I listened to her on the True Crime Garage podcast, she spoke in a very matter-of-fact way. She told the facts. 
She stated the timeline and she didn't waver. She only wanted to talk about the facts. She didn't make any accusations against anybody else, not even the friend. If she was guilty and was responsible, she would try to deflect in any way that she could, but she didn't do any of that. Again, she didn't speculate. She didn't shift blame to anyone. She didn't show any signs that would be indicative of somebody who is guilty and who is trying to hide things. It's just really, really disturbing to me that people will take these cases and just run with them without knowing absolutely anything. People are so quick to blame everything on certain people in cases just because it makes the case juicier and more entertaining. Someone's life and going missing is not your entertainment and neither is ruining someone else's life. So rather than feeding into the hysteria, I'm just going to leave it at I don't think that Brittany had anything to do with it. She just seems like a mother who is desperate to find her husband and that's it. That is all I have to say about Brittany and this theory. The next theory is that he decided to leave his own life. But again, I don't think that this theory is the most believable or the most likely because of the circumstances surrounding this entire thing. Sure, he was tired from working all of the time. Maybe he didn't want the responsibility of being a father anymore. You can speculate all of these types of things, but for this specific situation, it doesn't make the most sense. He wasn't prepared to leave. He didn't take any money out of his bank account. He didn't even have a working cell phone at the time because as far as I've seen, it died and has never been turned back on. Then the biggest thing pointing away from this theory is that he spoke into his phone trying to get directions back to the hotel. So we know that he had every intention of going back to the hotel. He was most likely just very disoriented and confused and couldn't find his way back. So I don't want to spend too much time on this theory because to me, it just doesn't seem very likely. Then same goes for the theory of him taking his own life. Again, he was trying to get back to the hotel. He was trying to get back to Brittany. So that doesn't really make sense for somebody who's trying to take their own life. So the next theory was that while he was in this exhausted and confused state, as he was making his way back to the hotel, of course, he was walking in the wrong direction. This is something that we've been talking about this entire video. And I think that that's pretty likely what happened. However, it's possible that as he was walking, he somehow fell into a swamp or a body of water and he succumbed to the elements and died and just hasn't been found. I think that this definitely could be possible. We know just how exhausted he was and if someone did drug his drink, it's very possible that he could have literally passed out as he was walking or his body could have been so exhausted just from not getting much sleep that he passed out as he was walking, fell asleep and succumbed to the elements. This is what was going through my mind this entire time that I was researching this case but the biggest thing that points away from this theory for me is the fact that nothing related to him has ever been found. The searches that were done for Tyler were extensive. They searched absolutely everywhere that they could and they did not find a single bit of evidence. That is just so strange to me and I don't even know how that can happen. It just seems so unlikely to me that he somehow just fell into somewhere that was so desolate and isolated or some body of water that was so big or deep that he just was never found. Nothing ever floated to the top of the water. Nobody stumbled across anything related to Tyler. I just don't see how that's possible. So I do think that this does seem like a very likely theory, but just the fact that nothing's ever been found really makes me question it. So another interesting theory that I saw was that after walking off from the friend again, he thought he was heading back to the hotel and then of course got confused and lost. Maybe he did pass out somewhere, possibly on the road. Or maybe he tried crossing the road without looking or was walking on the side of the road and wasn't really paying attention. Maybe once he ended up on the road somehow, either walking or passed out, somebody in a car accidentally hit him and killed him. Then in a panic, this person took his body and then dumped it somewhere and it just hasn't been found. We know that it was almost five in the morning when Tyler went missing. If somebody was drunk driving when they hit and killed Tyler, that could explain why they were so desperate to get rid of the evidence rather than going to jail for involuntary manslaughter for drunk driving. Especially if this was someone from the area who knew all of the swamps and the wooded areas and the ponds, they could have hit his body so well that it just hasn't been found. But with this theory, I do want to point out that Tyler is a pretty big guy. His dead weight would not have been easy to move at all. So to me, somebody definitely would have needed help in moving his body. 
So did this one person have another person in the car with them who was willing to help them? Did they phone a friend who was willing to get rid of this body? I almost wanna say it's pretty impossible to move an entire grown man's body completely by yourself when it's all dead weight. Of course, unless you're a bodybuilder or you go to the gym every day and lift weights every day, it just doesn't really seem possible. And especially if you're already intoxicated, that just adds another layer to all of this. I don't think that this is the most likely theory, but I definitely think that it could be a possibility, so I wanted to make sure I touched on it at least a little bit. So the last theory is that somebody saw Tyler in his confused and disoriented state and took advantage of him and killed him. I think that him being met with foul play for whatever reason is really the only thing that can explain why there has been no evidence found. But still, again, there is so much going against this theory. To believe this theory, we have to believe that somebody was just out and about at 5 a.m. saw Tyler stumbling around or maybe passed out at that point on the sidewalk or in the road, but either way, we have to believe that they saw him and just decided in that moment to harm him. Then they took every little bit of evidence, including his body, and just left and dumped it all somewhere and it just hasn't been found. I know there's unfortunately so many cases of somebody just being at the wrong place at the wrong time and being harmed because of that, but I just can't wrap my head around how that would happen in this case. Again, he's a pretty big guy. It would have been hard for someone to move him all by themselves unless they had like a pickup truck or a dolly or something. I don't know, something crazy. But other than that, I just can't see how this theory would even be possible. This is a case where I go through each theory and literally nothing seems reasonable. Literally, there's no theory that I can look at and say, yeah, that definitely seems the most likely. I do lean more towards him just wandering off and then falling somewhere where he succumbed to the elements and just hasn't been found. To me, that makes the most sense in my head. But again, like I said, why didn't they find any evidence anywhere? He couldn't have been more than a mile or two away from the hotel and it was searched very thoroughly. Why didn't they find anything? This case just makes absolutely no sense and I feel like I always wanna talk about, you know, the scenario about what I think happened in each case, but with this one, I really can't. I do think that he originally walked off with this friend and then the friend was trying to get Tyler to come back to the hotel and then Tyler again was being stubborn and said no, so the friend just came back and was like, you know, Tyler won't come back. He'll be fine. I'm exhausted. I need to go home. I don't really want to deal with this anymore. I personally think that that's how that happened with the friend. But then I think that after this friend left and Tyler walked off, he got lost somehow and then something happened. But again, what happened or when or why? I literally have no idea. I am really looking forward to hearing your guys' thoughts on this one because it really is just that confusing to me. But with that, that is where I'm going to end this case. Again, please make sure you go ahead and comment your thoughts and theories below. I'm really looking forward to the discussion on this one. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure you go ahead and email those suggestions over to rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Calm. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!